for Cape Breton Nova. Mr. Speaker, before you leave the chair, we in Her Majesty's loyal opposition have a number of matters we would like to raise for the consideration of the House. Now, I wasn't supposed to be the first speaker on the batting list. I'm actually number three. Uh, would it be possible for me to defer to, to the other two? Or no, I think they'll, they'll have to follow me. All right. Well, Mr. Speaker, the matter I wanted to raise with the House at this time relates to a uh, matter that has received some publicity. It is an individual grievance of a constituent of mine who has asked me to raise this matter on his behalf in the House. This is perhaps a rather unusual procedure, but I suppose the House of Assembly is the ultimate recourse of any citizen who feels aggrieved. And I therefore wish to raise with the House the matter of the expropriation of lands at South Inganish in the 1930s for the purpose of the uh, building or, or the development of the Cape Breton uh, Highlands National Park and how that adversely if, uh, impacted on a constituent of mine whose son has attempted to raise this matter as a public issue and to negotiate on behalf of his mother with the government. Now the background to all this is that a man by the name of James B. Donovan was dying of tuberculosis in 1931 and willed his home and 18 acres of land to his wife, Elizabeth Donovan. And two weeks after he signed that testamentary uh, document, he passed on to his reward on May 2nd, 1931 of tuberculosis. Now his wife, Elizabeth Donovan, she too caught the dreaded disease which at that time wiped out so many victims, tuberculosis, and she died in her turn of tuberculosis on August 8th, 1935, leaving five orphaned children, all very young, and who would be at law the proper heirs of the family property. However, because of the infancy of these children and the fact that they did not have proper legal representation or anyone to defend them, it uh, was apparently uh, the uh, wisdom of the municipal government of that time that this property would properly become the property of the municipality and by a resolution of the municipal council the council vested these lands to itself, then deeded them to the province for the purposes of the development of a national park, and finally the province deeded them to the government of Canada for the, con uh, for the, uh, for the construction and development of the Cape Breton Highlands National Park. Now in all of that, no compensation was paid to the owners who were the infant orphaned children, I would suppose from my own research, because there was no recognition given of them having any standing at law. They were not recognized as being owners of the property. They were children that were under the care of the Children's Aid Society and had been uh, given to some foster parent to uh, uh, be looked after. Now, in recent years, the uh, Donovan orphan children, five of them, are elderly people. And one of these five lives in my constituency, a woman by the name of Mrs. Judith Poulain, P-O-U-L-A-I-N, who lives on Mount Pleasant Street, 67 Mount Pleasant Street in Whitney Pier. And her son, whose name is Fabian, has undertaken on behalf of his mother a campaign of attempting to publicize the fact that the government has refused to pay any compensation to his mother or to the other uh, four, uh, one of whom I believe has now passed on, and uh, has undertaken a campaign of newspaper advertising. I believe that honorable members may have seen these ads in the press. I have some copies of them here, and if the pages wouldn't mind distributing these. 
I would appreciate it if a copy could be perhaps placed on the desk of each member of the House. You can bring any that are left over back to me. And uh, these ads have appeared in the press recently. They are paid adver uh, advertising. They're obviously not the work of a paid public relations firm. They're uh, homemade in terms of their composition and uh, design. I certainly had no hand in designing them. They are the work of Mr. Fabian Poulain of 67 Mount Pleasant Street, Sydney, who designed them and paid for them as a means of attempting to express his concern in a public forum uh, over the absence of any positive response by government to the uh, claims that he and, and council that he has retained have attempted to be uh, making uh, to this government for the better part now of 10 years. Now, I have a briefing kit here. I don't want to uh, distribute 50 copies of this briefing kit because I don't believe I have 50 copies, but I'll certainly be prepared to table one and to give another one to the Minister of Natural Resources, although this is only but a copy of a briefing package that I table that and give this to the Minister, Mr. Leaf, of a um, package which I believe is already in the Minister's possession. I have done some research on this because I feel that it would be irresponsible of an elected representative to espouse any cause without first attempting to persuade himself of the legitimacy of it. And I have uh, seen a deed of the late uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Donovan that very clearly describes the uh, property which she owned at the time of her demise. It is a deed which is in this briefing kit. It is dated April 14th, 1931, and it was duly registra registered at the Registry of Deeds for the County of Cape Breton. And this deed makes Elizabeth A. Donovan of Glace Bay in the County of Cape Breton the owner of a parcel of land at South Inganish, Cape Breton Island, be commencing at Freshwater Lake on the north side of land owned by James Doucette, thence in a western direction along said uh, line, fence, fence line I guess that should be, till it strikes the Glebe property, thence in an easterly direction until it strikes the fence of the lands of Colin Brewer, thence along lines of said land till it strikes Freshwater Lake, thence in a southern direction along Freshwater Lake, 20 chains to the place of beginning, containing 18 acres of land, more or less. So that deed, registered with the Registry of Deeds, uh, certainly establishes the fact that Elizabeth A. Donovan was indeed the owner of these lands. The birth registrations of her children should establish that they were her natural children, and those who are still living would be, one should think, at law, the heirs of any property that was owned by Elizabeth A. Donovan with clear title at the time of her demise. However, the government of Nova Scotia has attempted, in my view, to uh, avoid recognizing that fact. It has attempted to throw every, uh, uh, every loophole or every, every uh, red herring or cloud uh, that I could find uh, to, to argue that uh, these children uh, were not the heirs of their mother or that the mother did not own the land. I'm not sure exactly what their representation is because in correspondence that I've had with the minister and uh, in uh, private discussions of the matter with him, uh, and the minister concerned here is the Minister of Natural Resources, uh, I have at no time encountered any direct refusal to examine this matter. But I do have here in these briefing notes the documentary evidence of 10 years of attempts to press this matter with the government. Negotiations originally being opened with Premier John M. Buchanan and consider, can, uh, uh, continuing on with the Honorable D.L. George Henley, then Minister of Lands and Forests, 
and a host of other officials, lawyers, and uh, ministers over the intervening years, down to the time when the Honorable Chuck McNeil was Minister of Lands and Forests or Natural Resources, and now to the time when the Honorable John Leaf is Minister of Natural Resources. Now, 10 years is a long time to try to get a yes or a no from a government. The arguments that I've run into have always been obscure and uh, oblique rather than direct. Nobody has ever said to me, no, we will not consider this matter, but rather I've been told things like, well, this family will have to establish more clearly their title to these lands. Now, I don't know what could be clearer than a deed with a, with a description of the property. I grant that the property description on the deed is not up to the standards of contemporary surveying practice, but it was certainly the practice of the times in 1931, which was 61 years ago. And certainly there has been advancement and progress from that time to this. This we could not deny. And certainly a deed that was drawn up by the surveying standards of 1931 would not be as precise as one that might be drawn up today. And I suppose one could argue that the identifying points that are used in that description of lands might not be able to be identified clearly today because possibly the uh, fence lines and property uh, division points that are referred to may no longer exist or may no longer be able to ident be identified with exact precision. But certainly in a general sense, the parcel of land concerned can be identified. Certainly with more or less accuracy, it's possible to determine what is being talked about and to evaluate that land. I suggest that one reason why the government may seek to delay a consideration of this matter, and certainly 10 years, <laughs> 10 years waiting is ample evidence of delay, is the fact that the uh, persons concerned, the heirs, are now very elderly people, and I suppose if the thing can be dragged on another 10 years, well, perhaps by that time they may all have passed on to their reward, one having done so, so far. But I would like to say, sir, that I feel that the response of the government to this situation and to legal uh, representations being made to them by counsel and uh, by direct uh, representations by family members has not, in my view, been either as prompt or as sympathetic as uh, one might expect. All these people are asking for is the same thing anybody else would ask for under the same circumstances. If you or I, Mr. Speaker, owned a parcel of land and the government saw fit to expropriate it for the purposes of developing a park, we would be paid under our expropriations legislation in Nova Scotia at fair market value for that land. That is all. And certainly to try to take advantage of the fact that the property owner died and left five orphan children who were very youthful, very young, infants, minors, unaware of their legal rights, unrepresented by counsel in the care of the Children's Aid Society, to take advantage of that situation to avoid facing their claims now for compensation for their uh, uh, loss of value as well as their suffering over all these many years. 61 years is a, a long time or, or even 55 years or whatever number of years it may have been since that land was expropriated. So. I uh, simply say this, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I am prepared to raise this matter again, but I thought that perhaps by way of a uh, preliminary introduction, it might be well to uh, brief the House at this stage of my uh, uh, concern in this matter. And since you have indicated to me that the length of time that uh, I have for this speech is now concluded, uh, I will reserve further comment on this until a future time, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Story about five orphans who lost their land years ago but waited too long to fight back. That's tomorrow and tonight at 8 o'clock. Please join us for a special program, the 1992 Tattoo, hosted by MITV's Colleen Logan and Don Tremaine. Waited too long to fight back. The Donovan Orphans, tomorrow on The Graham Report. Tonight, part two of Bruce Graham's series, Deeds and Misdeeds. This evening, the story of a Cape Breton woman. She is one of five orphans who had their land taken away from them in the 1930s. 
Over 50 years later, the fight goes on. Here's Bruce Graham. When addressing land ownership in Nova Scotia, you can go back decades and find unfinished business. Judith Poulan of Sydney has some unfinished business. She's been gathering documents for years. She was one of five orphan children whose parents died of tuberculosis in the 1930s. When I come down here to our property, Gar uh, Angus Jahans, guardian for the five orphan children, were left here as orphans. But our property was invested in the municipality. And then over here it says, cannot be settled with. We've looked for compensation since 1939 and steadily since 1980. This is the land the Donovan children lost in the 1930s. It's at the entrance to the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, land that today is worth a lot of money. When the county of Inverness got this property in the 30s, it transferred it to the province of Nova Scotia, which in turn transferred it to the federal government. The five Donovan orphans were never paid a nickel for this land. And the question really is this, were their rights violated? Who was looking after the children and who was looking after their legal rights? We're at the end of the rope now, and the government has all the papers and the documents they need to show and to prove that that was our property. And it was taken without any cost. Are you hurt? Yes. You put a lot into this. Yes, indeed. What is it you want from the government? Are, are, are you looking for money? Are you looking for... for no, it's a satisfaction for a, an apology first. An apology for taking your land, right. for taking the land of five innocent children. Right. They took the land and there was no... They never gave us the answers. We had the questions, why? Nobody came forward. No, none of the authorities, whether it's Victoria County, where it all started, in Bedeck. And then they turned the land to the Nova Scotia government, and they in turn turned to the federal government for the park. And nobody, they found their mistake way back, and then they said, cannot be settled with. And uh, they just covered it up and went on. And they thought, well, five orphan children, what are they going to do? The Fulan family could take immediate legal action, but there is one hitch. It's the statute of limitation. In other words, legal time may have run out for them. Sydney lawyer Ron Jackson represents the Fulans. Outside of limitation, outside of the time limit, are they on legal, strong legal ground? If it, outside of statute of limitations? I, I believe so. I believe that there is uh, evidence, and I think there's fairly, uh, fairly solid evidence that uh, that the uh, transaction whereby the uh, county or the municipality of the county of Inverness acquired title uh, in 1932 or 33 uh, may may well be invalid. I think there is uh, you know s evidence there that would uh, stand up in the court of law. Judas' son Fabian figures the family's waited long enough. He's taking a more adversarial role running ads in maritime newspapers warning people of problems in the park. His action has drawn the ire of government and tourism officials. It's not stopping him. Right now he plans to publicize the family's fight with billboards. I feel compelled to put this sign up in many other billboards. And until the government responds in some fashion to my mother as to her concerns as to the illegal seizure of her property, I have no alternative but to do what I have to do in this matter. How big is this billboard going to be? Tell me about it. There's three billboards. This is the first site. I hope to have it up and running in the next week or two. It'll be 123 feet long by 60 feet tall. And what's it going to say? Basically, it'll tell the tourists of the area or the people of the area to call the numbers, the phone numbers, Parks Canada, the, the province of Nova Scotia, the tourism industry before entering onto the illegal, illegally seized properties by the government, they should contact these people to make sure there's no problems in this community. This is a picture of my grandfather, Donovan, and my grandmother, Donovan, Judith, and William. Indications are the Nova Scotia government is going to offer compensation in the Poulan case. Over 50 years after it all began, these orphans wonder if they can now find the justice 
they lost as children. MITV has learned the Nova Scotia government is considering a compensation package for Judith and her brothers and sisters, but so far, no offer has been made. Part three of Bruce Graham's series on land, deeds and misdeeds. In the 1930s, a government lawyer went to Morris Donovan's farm and told him he was getting $1,500 for his property, take it or get nothing. Fifty years later, Morris remembers. Here's Bruce Graham. Some of the most beautiful land in Canada can be found here in the Cape Breton Highlands. This is Morris Donovan. In his prime, he was a man of this land. He farmed it, worked it with his hands. Ultimately, he lost it. His farm expropriated. Like the Donovan orphans we told you about last night, it was taken for the Cape Breton Highlands National Park. The government lawyer comes to me, Smith McIver. He's dead now. I don't wish him bad, but he come to me, he told me, when he asked me, how much he expected for this? Well, I told him, he said, you're getting $1,500, take it or leave it. I said, if I don't take it, what then? He said, to take your property and how you want to get five cents. The day Morris Donovan left his property, they were already building the golf course at Inganish, and they had staked out one side and the other side, and they, they left him a corridor, a little pathway, to leave his property. And down that pathway, he walked his wife, his 14 children, and his farm animals. It was the last day he was on his land, and even now, in his 88th year, it's a day that he remembers vividly. It still brings tears to my eyes. To think about the way we were used. You talk about the expulsion of the Canadians. After all those years, we don't forget the turmoil. This was the expulsion of the Irish. I'll never forget it. No way. Could I ever forget that? I think a government. Would you that way? Morris Donovan got little sympathy from government and no support from outside sources. The newspapers of the day were mostly passive. It was all a dark page. The less you knew, the less questions you'd ask. Now, 88 years old, That's Morris good. Donovan, a man of this land still hopes the misdeed done him can be redressed. He has been waiting over half a century.